Greetings Apush scholars for our review on Unit 8 on the American West after the Civil War. Looking at the review sheet from top to bottom, the importance of the buffalo for the Plains Indians. Well, the Indians, as you know, used horses after the Spanish came, and the Plains Indians were able to follow the herds of buffalo, and they killed them and used them for food, used their hides for teepees, for shelter, for clothing, used their bones for various tools, and even used their the, uh, dried buffalo dung for fuel. So the buffalo were sort of like a wandering pantry for the buffalo. How the settlers conquered the Great Plains, and I'm looking on the review sheet, there's another importance of inventions and technology in Western development. Just some thoughts here. Because of the lack of wood, <coughs> the settlers on the Great Plains used uh, sod houses, nicknamed soddies. You've got John Deere's invention of the steel plow, which allowed settlers to break through the thick sod. You have Cyrus McCormick's mechanical reaper and other machinery that follows um, this, this idea of balers and threshers. You have windmills, which bring water up from deep below the, the surface. You have barbed wire used for fencing in the absence of uh, wood fencing. And you've got the railroad, which is going to connect farm settlements and cities across the Great West. White treatment of an impact on the Native Americans during westward movement. Well, you have, um, in the earliest American settlement, you have exclusion and you have land seizure. Eventually, you have this Indian Removal Act under Jackson kicking Indians across the Mississippi to Indian Territory, what would be modern-day Oklahoma. You have, as Americans relentlessly, white Americans move relentlessly western, uh, westward, you have the forced settlement on reservations. And under the Dawes Sovereignty Act, you have land taken away from Indians. The idea is to get rid of this communal ownership and turn the Indians into good American farmers by giving them individual titles to land and any extra land, any surplus land, would be sold to, um, to white American landowners. And you also have, remember William Tecumseh Sherman, his great plan for defeating the Indians is to destroy the buffalo, to force the Indians to sue for peace and receive um, government reservation land and um, limited subsidies for living on that land. Indian response to white settlers, well, after the Civil War, like before it, you have uh, sort of futile uh, resistance, you, which almost always ultimately led to failure as the Americans were greater in number and uh, you know, technologically and militarily superior. And the Indians um, sometimes signed treaties either out of um, you know, being forced to or hoping for the best, but these treaties were always broken. And uh, Indian treaty land, Indian reservation land was continually trespassed. Think about the Black Hills, the discovery of gold and think of Indian Territory itself, which later becomes the state of Oklahoma. And subsidies and, and uh, monies that were promised to Indian reservations were often pilfered, often stolen by the Bureau of Indian Affairs administrators. So the story of the treatment of Indians is one of um, really shameful treatment. And looking on the review sheet here, you should know Helen Hunt Jackson's A Century of Dishonor. And it's a, a story of the government's mistreatment of the Indians and this history of broken promises. And those of you who have time, I'd point you to uh, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee by Dee Brown. The uh, um, mining's effect on the frontier drew settlers and the, the, um, the miners that moved into western areas, California, Colorado, Nevada, wherever, sped the political organization of these areas into territories and eventually into statehood. The minerals that were mined in the West, namely gold and silver, helped the North fund the Civil War. And um, in particular, this is not the far West, of course, this would be the Midwest, but the Upper Peninsula of Michigan um, provided much of the iron ore, which was used for um, the, you know, the, the, the mini balls that, that mowed down the Southern armies. The, um, how did the West uh, develop economically? Well, it developed by the hard work and the settlement of farmers and cowboys and ranchers and miners and lumbermen that extracted and developed Western resources. 
and often individual farmers and individual miners were followed by corporate bonanza farms and by hydraulic mining companies using expensive machinery. So this idea of the independent farmer is um, is side by side with these very large uh, bonanza farms. And these are large scale operations of perhaps tens of thousands of acres with perhaps hundreds to over a thousand part-time seasonal workers planting and harvesting using using machinery. And long before the combustion engine, 40, 50 years before this, you have steam engine driven um, equipment being used to, to plant and to, to harvest. The importance of natural resources, um, just think back to that the, 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 the question here, how did the West develop economically? Um, natural, the, the grasslands brought in um, cowboys and brought in ranchers and farmers. You have the minerals in the hills bringing various miners for copper and for silver and gold and whatever the valuable minerals are. And then you have uh, lumbermen who are um, felling trees, especially um, especially in the, uh, the northern Midwest. You have the trees in places like Michigan are building much of the housing throughout the center of the, of the country. The importance of occupations and religion in Western development, again, farmers, Cowboys, ranchers, prospectors, miners, lumbermen, railway builders, railway workers, <coughs> soldiers. As far as religion, um, the AP once had a DBQ where they had a document talking about the Mormons moving to Utah. This idea of the Great Trek and the handcart pioneers under Brigham Young and those seeking religious freedom in Utah. The Homestead Act gave away... This is in 1862, in the middle of the Civil War, it gave away 160 acres of land for anyone who would live on those acres for five years, and 270 million acres of land was given away to about 400,000 families or to about 1.6 million homesteaders. The Morrill Land Grant Act, also in 1862, its purpose here was to create agricultural schools, agricultural universities, by giving 30,000 acres of federal land per member of Congress that a particular state had, according to the 1860 census. And this land, or the proceeds from the sale of this land, were used to establish and fund colleges. And after the Civil War, the Morrill Land Grant Act was also extended to ex-Confederate states and to even eastern states that weren't, you know, obviously weren't in the West. So all told, 106 universities have their roots in the Morrill Land Grant Act. I'll just give you a small handful out of this, 106 ones that are maybe um, better known here. Just looking at some alphabetically here, Auburn, University of California, Colorado State, University of Florida, University of Georgia, University of Illinois, Purdue, Michigan State University, University of Minnesota, Texas A&M, just to name a few. These are come out of the Moral Land Grant system for more efficient and more effective farming. The Exodusters, about 40,000 blacks will leave the, uh, the racist and segre uh, segregated and oppressive post-war South and will make their way to Kansas and to Oklahoma and Colorado and they're going to take up this Homestead Act um, offer of land and to reinvent themselves as free farmers. Buffalo Soldiers, these are black soldiers. These are black soldiers who after the Civil War are going to become peacetime soldiers mostly in the West. And the term has three possible origins. One is the Indians named them this because of their curly hair looking like, like buffalo hair. Um, also because perhaps they were sporting buffalo robes uh, made out of the American bison on the Great Plains. Or perhaps just that they're brave, that they're strong like the buffalo. But this was a term um, of respect. This was um, not an insult, but this was a, a term of admiration. The Pacific Railway Act, also of 1862, is going to provide the money and the subsidies to build the first transcontinental railroad which finally opens in 1869 with the uh, merger of the western and eastern routes at Promontory Point in northern Utah. And these subsidies and land grants, uh, many millions of acres of land are given on land grants and what's happening here is that land grants are given in a checkered pattern along the railway where the government land is going to increase in value 
and the railways are going to sell this land to, uh, to sellers, to migrants and to overseas immigrants. The two railways of note that built the first transcontinental railroad heading from the east towards the west from Omaha is the Union Pacific and from Sacramento is the Central Pacific. And who built it heading east on the Central Pacific? Well, because of the war going on and because of a shortage of labor, because of um, a lot of men um, out in the, in the gold fields, the Chinese came. The Chinese came earlier in the 1850s to prospect for gold, but um, by the, you know, the end of the Civil War, the Chinese are about 10% of the population of California. Grant told about 11,000 Chinese laborers worked on the Central Pacific Railway, especially putting it through the hard to uh, tunnel Sierra um, uh, <clears throat> Nevada Mountains. And the, um, again, the reason for the Chinese building this were because of mines drawing off laborers, the Civil War, and because of this, the really tough, sort of wretched conditions they had to work in. The Credit Mobilier a scandal is a scandal involving a construction company building the eastern portion of the Transcontinental Railroad uh, for the Union Pacific is going to trade stock for, subs for, um, for subsidies. The, they're, they're going to get a contract. The contract is paying for inflated prices, inflated prices for laying this track in return various congressmen are receiving stock that's inflated in value because of uh, cooking the books here. And the Vaqueros are Mexican cowboys. The AP does want you to know minority history here. And about a third of all the cowboys, the famous cowboys in American culture, are either black or Hispanic, namely Mexican cowboys. And vaquero comes from the Spanish vaca, right? Cow, vaqueros, cowboys. So just some thoughts here on um, Western development, especially after the Civil War. The questions, um, the essay questions that I can remember from past AP tests are <clears throat> who's moving West and to what extent is the West a land of opportunity? And how, for what is enabling Americans to develop the West? And this would be a question on how did we get the land? From whom did we get it? And what's the effect of technology? What's the effect of specific groups of people? What's the effect, perhaps, of religion concerning the Mormons? Um, and the, th uh, the third question, um, there was once a question, talk about development in the country after the Civil War. And you were to pick uh, two of three regions, talk about the South, the West, or the North. So it's kind of a general open-ended question on what's going on in the West after the Civil War. So there's, those are some thoughts on the review sheet. Study well. Uh, know it's on the sheet here because it reflects something that will be on the test. Good luck signing out.